Rainbow Cup is just around the corner and they have decided to, I guess, follow suit from something that's been happening in Super Rugby, both Australia and New Zealand, and put in some law variations for the competition. Now, still fingers crossed the entire thing goes ahead because apparently there's still been some doubts. And uh, this may all be all redundant in a few days, depending on what happens, but knock on wood that uh, everything goes ahead and it's well planned and well managed. I know it's not the easiest thing to prepare an all new sports competition in the middle of a pandemic. But let's go over these three law variations and I will try to share. I know some of you guys probably already watch Super Rugby. Maybe some of you watch New Zealand, maybe not Australia, vice versa. Uh, but just kind of share what we've seen as the impact of these variations on our competition and what you may expect to see in the Rainbow Cup. Pro 16, whenever that kind of stuff comes through. Uh, the first one is the red card law variation. If you haven't seen what the deal with that one is, the exact wording is, uh, for red cards, the offending player will leave the field as usual, but after 20 minutes, the team can replace the player with one of their nominated substitutes. The clock for the 20-minute period will be managed by, sorry, managed in the same way as the sin bin and will pause for stoppages in play. So essentially, your player gets red carded, the player is gone. That player cannot come back after 20 minutes. That person is gone for the game. But after 20 minutes, you can put a substitute on to, to replace that person. So it's not the same as a yellow card that the person comes back on. The person is done. But you can go back to 15 on 15 with a person being substituted. Now, I know that one's um, not everyone's cup of tea. Uh, there's some worries that it will cause more... Um, maybe deliberate foul play and potentially uh you know more injuries that kind of thing and that the whole idea behind a red card is that your offending is so egregious that you should be gone for the game and your team has to pay the price the other argument for that the reason that at least uh, it was implemented down here is the idea that having 14 on 15 for like 75 minutes ruins the spectacle of the game now there's two camps for that spectacle is more important player health and safety uh, guys need to follow the laws, you know, they need to do everything that they can to, uh, you know, promote entertaining rugby. You guys have all heard the arguments before. Uh, from what we've seen in Super Rugby Aotearoa and Super Rugby Australia, Aotearoa has only had one red card. One red card. And we're already up to eight rounds. So two games each round. Uh, Australia has gone through nine rounds and they've had one, two, three, four, five. They've had six red cards. So a lot more in Australia than we have seen in New Zealand. But they also have the same law, you know, trial about 20 minute replacements. So <clears throat> of the red cards we've seen, we've seen uh, a few of them. I would say one, uh, two, three, which have kind of been careless shoulders to the heads. Guys tackling too high. Just not getting low enough. You've seen it a hundred times now. Guys just tackling too high. They go in with the shoulder. The player carrying the ball is slightly dipping and the shoulder just cracks them straight in the head. Those ones have been getting red carded. Uh, only in one did the player though not stay on the field. Of all these red cards that we've seen in Super Rugby. So uh, I think it was Ala Alato was hit on Fa'o Mosili. Fa'o Mosili went off. HIA didn't come back on. Every other card, though, the person who was the victim of the offense managed to stay on the field. So um, I don't think we've seen deliberate attempts to take out star players and that kind of thing. There's also been a tip tackle. There's been a second yellow card, which led to a red card. There's been a punch, which for mine is like the most egregious because that's a deliberate act, whereas shoulder to the head is poor, poor technique, but often not deliberate. Um... And yeah, so I don't think we've seen huge amounts of uh, increase in, in foul play based on the fact that you can replace the player after 20 minutes. It's certainly reduced the, <clears throat> ruins the spectacle argument, but remember of all these red cards, the double yellow was in the 79th minute, one of the shoulders to the head was in the 70th minute, and another one was in the 73rd. So in those cases, it's made no difference anyway. It would have, wouldn't have been replaced um, you know, it still just acts like a red card. The others, 59th minute, um, and the couple that were early, 40th minute, 37th minute, um, you know, they did get to replace the person and the game kind of continued as normal. But yeah, I don't think 
if the, the what we've seen kind of applies, I don't think we've got too much to worry about <clears throat> in terms of guys deliberately trying to get themselves banned and take out other players, personally. Uh, what else have we got? We've got the dropout, <clears throat> goal line dropout. Uh, for held up over the line knock-ons that occur in goal when the ball is grounded by a defending player after a kick through, <clears throat> the defending team will take a dropout from anywhere on the goal line. The dropout must occur without delay and cut across the goal line traveling five meters. So basically, <clears throat> they're reducing the five meter scrums. Your team gets held up over the line, hot on attack. The other team gets to kick it back to you. So it's not a 22 dropout, so you lose that kind of extra 22 meters. <clears throat> generally, the teams who have been getting it are running it straight back, so they're generally back into the 22 on the return. What it does kind of seem to favor is the defensive teams get a more of an out. Whereas, you know, a five meter scrum is hardly getting out of trouble. You're still well in the cauldron, right? But a dropout is a bit a bit more of a let off. I mean, you still have to be hot on defense, but not quite like a five meter scrum. The argument is that gets the game going quicker because you don't have to set a scrum, you don't get scrum resets. But personally, I still miss the idea of having a five meter scrum on attack. It does make teams slightly more careful not to get held up. They don't go for kind of a 50-50 one. They might be able to get it down. They're more likely to wait for a more sure thing, especially when they, you know, just the forwards are going at it one off, one off guys from the side of a ruck, you know? So, yeah, it does favor the defending team a little bit, in my opinion. Um, but it's not a huge change. It's not... I, I was really against that one. I would still prefer the old system, uh, personally, because I think you really need to earn getting out of jail, right? If you're the defensive team and you're going through phase after phase after phase, and then they get a five minutes run, you go do the whole thing again. I prefer that one personally. And I just think the, the props need something to do, man. An attacking scrum five meters out is a beautiful thing. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, the last one is the captain's challenge. So in this one, each team is allowed one captain's challenge in the match. These can be used for try scoring and foul play incidents, or to challenge any refereeing decision in the last five minutes of the match. Challenge will be referred to the TMO. Review the footage when making the decision with the foot referee making the final decision. Teams will have one challenge per game. If the challenge is successful, they keep their challenge. If it's unsuccessful, they lose their challenge and can't challenge anything else. Now, this one also looks pretty good on paper, right? Because sometimes players know they've been punched off the ball um, or, you know, high tackled or there's been a bit of obstruction and um, there's been a knock on in the build up to a try. The refs are the only ones. Who uh, so to have that captain's challenge is a good way to, you know, right that wrong. And I think it's worked that way for the most part. Now, remember, Australia doesn't have this one. This one's unique to New Zealand. Uh, for the most part, we haven't seen it abused. But in the last few rounds, remember, we're eight rounds into the competition now. We have seen it getting abused. And what do I mean by that? Remember, it says in the last five minutes of the match, they can use it for anything, not just for the build-up to a try. It can be for anything. So we've seen teams who know they are in deep, deep trouble. They know they are one score or one loss of possession away from losing the game. And when a decision goes against them, they will just immediately throw out a captain's challenge It's cynical as because they know nothing really happened, but oh, just take a check because otherwise we're, we're stuffed. We have seen a little bit of that. So that's that's probably the players learning how to use the tool. It's the same with any kind of law change you make. There's the intended consequence, which is to stop the, the stuff they miss. But then there's the unintended consequence of the guys using it cheekily. We saw that in the Crusaders game at the weekend. They were a point behind. They were attacking. They were in the Chiefs half. They were going phase after phase and the Chiefs won a turnover and the Crusaders were just like, oh, just check the turnover to make sure he was supporting his own body weight. It was fine. It was just a waste of everybody's time and a cynical use of it. My Blues did it as well. Um, I think they were checking obstruction. Yeah. So that one is kind of a double-edged sword. You will see more stoppages. You will see some incorrect calls reversed, but you will also sit around waiting for them to review footage. And sometimes it takes them a while to find the footage. If the captain is like six phases ago or 10 phases ago, or back when we were down that end of the field, this guy, you know, no arms to me, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, like anything, 
there's never a change without some kind of unintended consequence. So that's kind of what you can expect from my point of view. I don't think the red cards thing will increase the egregiousness of the guy's behavior. I think it's pretty much par for the course. Like I said, Aotearoa New Zealand has only had one red card. Australia's had a few more. Uh, but nothing really what I would consider foul, like eye gouging or, you know, really, really dirty stuff. Uh, the dropouts, they do get the game started a bit quicker. They do favor the defensive team, in my opinion. I would prefer to see the five meter scrums um, and the 22 dropouts. But it does create situations where guys are scrambling back. It increases the kicking into the goal area, that kind of thing. So it depends kind of what you want to see. It's a rugby league thing, that one. And uh, the captain's challenge, as I said, sometimes they're going to use it well and sometimes they're going to use it in a kind of annoying way. But anyway... You guys let me know what your thoughts are. Uh, are you worried about these changes? Is there anything you're particularly looking forward to? I'm just looking forward to seeing some South African teams, some top European teams going at it, and we should get some, some good action. Anyway, fingers crossed everything goes ahead. Everyone stays safe, and um, yeah, we don't see too many silly captain's challenges. But anyway, you guys let me know your thoughts, and I will talk to you again soon. See you later.